Today I'm speaking with William Irvin about the wisdom of Stoic philosophy. And the Stoics have a tremendous amount to teach about the art of living a happy life. And uh, William Irvin has written the best introduction to Stoicism that I've read. The book is called A Guide to the Good Life, The Ancient Art of Stoic Joy. And uh, I really recommend you pick up the book. It's also a great audiobook, though he doesn't read it. And in this conversation, I have William walk us through the, the general philosophy and its methods here. We talk about what it means to have a philosophy of life, the similarities between Stoicism and Buddhism, what it means to have tranquility as a goal of living an examined life. Uh, we talk about negative and positive emotions, how we respond to setbacks, the techniques of Stoicism, like negative visualization, how to avoid regret, and uh, many other topics. And as I point out in the conversation, Stoic philosophy is a great complement to meditation practice. And I came to it quite late. I only started reading Seneca and Marcus Aurelius a few years ago. But it seems to me that the real strength of Stoicism is that it gives some very clear thought-based strategies for avoiding negative emotions, like anger and regret and envy and sadness. And it is a practice. It's not just a matter of reading a few books. You do have to apply it. But unlike mindfulness, it works on a conceptual level, wherein you generally reframe negative experiences in ways that prevent you from having your habitual negative reactions. And in many situations, reframing in this way is actually more powerful than merely being mindful, even if you can practice mindfulness at a very high level. Because if the way you're thinking about a situation is making you angry, say, the anger will keep coming back every time you get lost in thought. Of course, you can be mindful of the anger, and it will dissipate, but it will come back again the moment you're no longer mindful. But if you can find a fundamentally different way of thinking about the situation that you're in, one that actually makes you happy, right, or at least not angry, you've solved your internal problem in a much more comprehensive way. And this is really what Stoicism is good for. William Irvin is a professor of philosophy at Wright State University, and he's the author of seven books, most recently The Stoic Challenge, A Philosopher's Guide to Becoming Tougher, Calmer, and More Resilient, and I also recommend that book. William has also written for the Wall Street Journal, Time, and the BBC, and he lives in Dayton, Ohio. And now, without further delay, I bring you William Irvin. I am here with William Irvin. Bill, thanks for joining me. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. So you have written what I and, and many other people consider to be the best introduction to Stoicism, an ancient philosophy that has become very popular of late. Uh, you're certainly one of the reasons why. Maybe you, you know more about how this started than I do. And that book is A Guide to the Good Life. And then you've written another book, which is a follow-up, The Stoic Challenge. A Philosopher's Guide to Becoming Tougher, Calmer, and More Resilient. First, thank you for doing this. It's really, it's, it's great to get your voice here. Oh, it, it's uh, my pleasure to be here. And I, I, you know, I'm here partly, I'm a, I'm a teacher, college professor, and part of my goal is to spread the Stoic uh, word because it has the potential to change people's lives in an interesting way. Yeah, where did, this is something you observe in, I think, both your books that it used to be that philosophy really was just synonymous with our best thinking about how to live a good life. And at some point, it became a more uh, recondite and uh, ineffectual discipline. And you know, it became something with uh, respect to the academic turn and its fixation on language. And you know, I think we can blame. Wittgenstein for some of this, but where did philosophy cease to become about living a good life and, and actuating something we could unpretentiously, at least at one point, refer to as wisdom? Yeah, it's an interesting thing. So I went to college uh, starting in 1970, 
and did take philosophy courses. And I was introduced to the Stoics, but I was introduced to Stoic logic. They were some of the preeminent logicians of the ancient world. So I was introduced to their logic, but not to what they would call their ethics. And, you know, that word has mixed meanings. So today we think of moral right and wrong, but for them it was this question of having a good life. A better way to put it is they had what could be called a philosophy of life or a philosophy for living. And the striking thing was that although I took philosophy courses, I not only wasn't exposed to that concept, but the striking thing is I came away with the impression that any philosopher who spent his time thinking about such things wasn't a real philosopher. And even when I wrote the um, Guide to the Good Life, this would have been in the mid-2000s, I had, uh, you know, in the back of my, my head was all, all the time this voice saying, you know, this means you're, you're not a real philosopher if this is what you're, you're doing. Mm. But the deeper I got into it, and I actually, uh, you know, read the life story of Zeno of Sidium, who was the first Stoic, and you go back to his time, if you wanted to teach philosophy, you had to start a school. You know, kind of like today, you, somebody might start a school of martial arts and then have students that, that taught a, a particular kind of martial arts. That's what the Stoics were doing back then. Mm. And uh, Zeno actually tried a few other philosophies. He tried to, be, to join other philosophical schools came away thinking that what he needed to do was kind of do a mix and match of schools he had been exposed to and come up with his own new philosophy. And then after that, the way you would succeed is by getting paying students, people who would come and be very interested in what you had to say. You know, and he figured, well, okay, so what I want to do is I'm going to teach the logic because that's going to help people who are going to go into politics or go into law in some sense. But I'm also going to show them how to have a good life. I'm going to give them information in how they could have the best life. Because, you know, what they do for the, their occupation is one aspect of their life. There's a whole lot more to it. That second part simply vanished. And it's even worse than that. And, and you know, I can say these things. I'm I'm a full professor. I'm, I'm at the end of my career trail here. If they had the position of, of not professors who weren't merely full, but were truly bloated, I could maybe move on to that, but that doesn't exist. So then the question is, what do I owe to the profession? And I think one of the things I can do is just a, a nudge here of, you know, there is something else that we not only can be doing, but should be doing. So. What is Stoic philosophy? What is the, the point of view? And who are the principal Stoics after Zeno? Okay, so first, what is Stoic philosophy? It's philosophy of life. And uh, that's a very interesting concept, because like I said, when I was in college, I wasn't exposed to that. I, in fact, it was systematically excluded from what we were, we were talking about. So a philosophy of life in the sense that the Stoics had in mind and most of the ancient philosophers had in mind, and in the sense that I had in mind, has two goals. First goal is to specify what in life is of greatest value. And second goal is to specify uh, specific techniques for how to attain the thing of value. Because, you know, unless they, they give you the techniques, then it's all just a uh, just a dream. Hey, here's, here's the kind of life you, you want to live or you should be living. Go ahead and go for it without a clue of, of how, to, how to get there. And they had a specific kind of, they had answers to those questions. But let me back up a little bit here and describe to you how I came to be a Stoic and how I came to realize the importance of having a philosophy of life. So this would have been in the early 2000s. I seem retrospectively to be uh, having some kind of midlife crisis. I, was, I think I was turning 40 
yeah, that must have been it. And so one of the things I did is I thought, you know, what I should do is become a Zen Buddhist. But before I do that, I need to find out more about Zen Buddhism. And I also thought this is a classic example of an academic two for the price of one. I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll write a book. And in the book, I'll research Zen Buddhism, and I'll also get a publication out of it. And in the research of Zen Buddhism, to be complete, though, first is to realize it is what I've just referred to as a philosophy of life. And I thought, okay, to be complete, I should talk about what the alternatives are to Zen Buddhism. So Zen Buddhism says what in life is most worth having. And I, I could get some pushback on this, but one reading of what they said is it's tranquility. And tranquility is an interesting mm -hmm. word. We can argue about what tranquility does and doesn't mean, but it's tranquility. And then they gave us their strategy for attaining tranquility. And, you know, it requires meditation of various kinds. And if you do those meditations for long enough, you'll have your, your moment of enlightenment and it'll come as a, as a great flash. And you could have the moment of enlightenment the next day. You could wait 30 years to have the moment of enlightenment or the moment of enlightenment might never come. So there's their goal, tranquility. There's their strategy for attaining that goal, a particular kind of meditation. Okay, and I know you are very uh, deep into meditation and there are different forms it can take. But this is what I interpreted Zen Buddhism to involve. So I started looking at alternatives, philosophies of life provided by religion and philosophies of life provided by philosophy. And it was when I was doing the philosophical component that I re-encountered the ancient Stoics and realized, number one, is that they had the same goal as the uh, Zen Buddhists did and that is tranquility. They called it ataraxia, and whether tranquility is the correct translation of that is an, an interesting question. But it was a similar kind of thing, and I guess at some point we have to talk about what tranquility is, but let me keep mm -hmm. pushing on on this line. So they had a radically different strategy for how to first attain and then maintain that strategy. What they had is not meditation. They had psychological techniques. And the interesting thing is this, the psychological techniques are, are just there, very obvious. You know, some of uh, the Zen meditation techniques are truly mysterious. You know, you, you solve these koans, you, you do things like that. But as far as the, the Stoics were concerned, no, it's straightforward. There are things you can do. And they give specific advice on how to do them. And they say, if you do these things, you will know in a matter of days whether Stoicism is making a difference in your life. So I sized up that situation. And, you know, one is maybe 30 years of meditation that might or might not lead to a moment of enlightenment. Or, you know, a good three day weekend could be, could be hmm. all all that I need. And so I get decided to give it a try and was very quickly just taken by it, by how effective the strategies they used worked. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I just want to echo a few things you said there and then, and then we'll, we'll press on into stoicism proper. But as you do, as you point out in, in both of your books, there, there are parallels between stoicism and Buddhism. There are also areas of overlap between stoicism and other ancient Greek philosophies that were aiming at similar psychological goals. I think the skeptics also had ataraxia as a specific yes. goal, yeah. And the Epicureans as well. And that was another startling thing for me, that you had multiple philosophical schools that overlapped on their idea of what the goal should be and just had radically different ideas of how to best attain the goal. Yeah. So a couple of concepts to pick apart here. So one is the, and we'll talk about this, you know, Buddhism does focus a lot on 
meditation as a tool. And as listeners will be um, will expect, I think it's an incredibly useful and even indispensable one in the end. But it is in fact different from a more conceptual kind of higher cognitive tool that we can talk about in terms of reframing experience and framing and and reframing is something that you talk about in your books and they they're just fundamentally different tools that are totally complementary but as you point out reframing is incredibly easy to get a hold of it's not at all paradoxical people do it in in other areas of their lives in a kind of haphazard way but stoicism amounts to a probably the most deliberate invocation of that tool I can think of. And it's it's just, it's incredibly skillful. And and part of this conversation will be a very practical walk through the technique of reframing so as to give people a sense of just how quickly they can change their relationship to experience by thinking in these ways. The other point I would make before we press on is that the goal of tranquility or peace can sound somewhat deflationary to Western ears. I mean, we, in the West, we think a lot about happiness and well-being and joy, and we think that in some sense, a, a life well-lived will be lived continually at, in this sort of higher register of, you know, smiling-faced laughter and peaks of pleasure. I think there's good reason to believe that's not a psychologically attainable goal. But what is attainable is a deeper and deeper sense of well-being amid the changes in experience, both positive and negative, and having a mind that is less and less reactive in the face of the inevitable insults of of, of negative experience and the, the inevitable dissolution of positive experience. No matter how positive your experiences are, they have the, the nature to arise and pass away. And this is, you know, this is something that Buddhism focuses on a lot, but the Stoics did as well. So the goal of tranquility, it can sound kind of superficial and disengaged, but it's actually supremely engaged and engaged with much less fear and anxiety and grasping than most people are used to. It's not a retreat from experience that uh, the Stoics are counseling. They're just talking about how you can upgrade your firmware to the point where you are not viewing inevitable mishaps as problems. Rather, they're, they're opportunities to deepen your, your engagement with life and, and your, your ability to not suffer unnecessarily. Yeah, I, I agree that, first of all, Buddhism, there are several different forms Buddhism can take. And for whatever reason, my primary interest was in Zen, but I agree that there's a compatibility there. By no means are they mutually exclusive kinds of activities. And in fact, I would like in the future to explore meditation to a greater uh, length, uh, spurred on in part by, uh, I'm a listener to your podcast and I'm spurred on by that. No, no. So you can do both. It's also compatible with religion. In fact, in uh, religion, you find the, uh, in Christian religion at any rate, you find Stoicism poking its nose in like the serenity prayer, you know, grant me the power, the mm-hmm. things I can control. I'm blanking on what it is. That's, that's lifted right out of Stoicism. So you could do both. There is no reason why you couldn't. And in fact, you could make the case that you should be doing both. And that if you really want to have the greatest shot at at tranquility and a good life. So let me say a little bit more about tranquility because it's another word. Number one, people can uh, can challenge whether what we would call tranquility today is 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 how how it's related to what the uh, Stoic philosophers were aiming at. But then there's another big problem, and that is people assume that tranquility is a zombie-like state where you you simply aren't experiencing any emotions. The Stoics were not anti-emotional. They were anti-negative emotions. They had nothing wrong with mm. po- against positive emotions. So negative emotions include things like 
envy, hatred, anger, fear, anxiety. You go through, go through the list. On the other hand, positive emotions, and I, the two I, I like to talk about are the sense of delight, that you take delight in a variety of things, and that's something that I have really worked on. And there's just, we live in a world where there are full of things that can delight us, and most people are oblivious to that. And one level up from that, if they experience joy, they embrace the joy they're experiencing. Now, at the same time, there are positive emotions that are going to disrupt your tranquility. Those positive emotions, emotions I just described, are compatible with a state of tranquility. But there are others, you know, you can, you can simply be overly enthusiastic about things. And, you know, there are, are, are certainly drugs that can create a certain emotional states in you. And they would say, well, well, no, we're going we're gonna to draw a line there. But things like joy, joy at being alive, joy at being part of this universe. I mean, these are really fundamental things. And, and to get there takes a little bit of effort. So Stoics are not Stoical. Uppercase S Stoics, those who follow Stoicism as yeah. a philosophy of life, are not lowercase S Stoical. Because in the normal term, that just means somebody who's immune to emotion. The Stoics were for emotion, but positive emotions to a certain level. And their strategies are designed to avoid experiencing negative emotions. Okay, so before we get into the actual exercises, and, and again, you, in your books, you, you recommend some very practical approaches, very much in line with the recommendations of the Stoics themselves. Who, in your view, were the most important Stoics and the best exemplars of the, the philosophy? So in my own uh, approach to Stoicism, you start with the Greek Stoics, people like, I told you, uh, Zeno of Sidium, and he was followed by Cleanthes and, and Chrysippus, or Chrysippus, I've heard it pronounced both ways. And they are of less interest to me than what followed them, and that's the Roman Stoics. They're of less interest in part because we don't have many of their writings. We have people telling us what they said, but we don't have their writings. Their writings, for the most part, have been lost. The Roman Stoics are the ones that I was most attuned to. I found myself most attuned to because they are very big on coming up with these strategies for how to avoid negative emotions. And they include uh, Seneca, Marcus Aurelius, Epictetus, and uh, the fourth lesser known one was a Stoic named Musonius Rufus. Of those, Seneca appeals most to my own personality. And, and let me make a comment about what, what I was talking about before here. You know, the interesting thing is, as I've published these books, I get, I get emails from people who are trying Stoicism. And periodically, I get an email from somebody who says, you know, I've been doing what you say all my life. You're just giving it fancy names. And so it's something I haven't gone into in the books, but has intrigued me. And that is whether some people just have personalities that are very well mm. suited to Stoicism. And I also know people that I would say are just in the opposite camp. They have personalities. They seem to thrive on anxiety. If they, if they reach a point where there's nothing to worry about, they'll find something to worry about. So in my own case, you know, when I said I'm, I was attracted to Stoicism in a way that I wasn't attracted to meditation or Zen Buddhist meditation. It's because I think a personality thing. I think I was a congenital Stoic. I think I, I was wired in the, the kind of the Stoic manner of uh, look on the bright side of things. And um, so it makes it easy for me, whereas it might be difficult for somebody else. So I'm not saying it's for everybody, but here's the deal. The cost to try it out is really low. <laughs> So uh, mm -hmm. you owe it to yourself to try it out and uh, might work, might not. Uh, and if it does, it can be uh, profoundly life-changing. Let's try it out. In your second book, you write a lot about the concept of a, a setback. How do you view 
this notion and what do you do with it? Okay. So let me uh, okay. pause you there. That's actually my third Stoic book. Oh, it's your third Stoic book. Okay. There was as, and so what I did, the, the first one, Guide to the Good Life, this was an introduction to Stoicism. And to put it into kind of literary historical context, so it was published in, in 2008. And at that time, if you had gone on Amazon, you would have had perhaps 40 books that had Stoicism in the title. And most of those were written for an academic audience, written by philosophy professors for philosophy professors, with a few that were written for a general audience. And I had just come out of this research that introduced me to Stoicism. And I thought, well, this is a great next book. What I'll do is I'll write a book that's just an introduction to Stoicism. And I was really convinced that there would be almost nobody on the planet Earth who would buy it, you know, maybe a dozen people and six of them would be socially obligated to buy it. Maybe half of them would actually read it. But the idea was there is no market for this. And yet I feel compelled to do it. I think it could be useful. And recently, I went back and looked again at Amazon listings, uh, again, Stoicism in the title, and I could find 440 titles of Stoicism. That's 10 times as many books. Mm -hmm. Not only that, but they're coming out at the rate of about four books per week. What do you attribute this renaissance in Stoicism to? I'm not sure. And, and it's an interesting thing. And this is something we can talk about. This is a little bit more, Stoicism itself seems apolitical, but there is a, an interesting political spin on this because in that same period, we saw the rise of, of what I've uh, lately been referring to as anti-Stoics. They aren't anti in the sense of being opposed to Stoics. They're anti in the sense of being the polar opposite of Stoics. So whereas Stoics are going out of their way to, when confronted by setbacks, simply to overcome them and then uh, quietly go on about their way. At the same time as Stoicism was rising, there were people who took the opposite approach. And that is when set back, they felt aggrieved, they felt angry, it was injustice, and they found complaints. They had complaints and it's, it seemed like they were nurturing them. I'm hearing the rumblings of victim culture in the background. Yes, yes. And so, so, so to answer your question, I'm not sure why the Stoic Renaissance happened now. You know, I'm not sure what, what, what kind of changed there that it used to not be happening and then it was happening. And it's also happening in strange places. So for instance, this uh, Silicon Valley seems to be, I've heard, I've been told, a hotbed of Stoic interest. So I don't know why, but, you know, just in thinking about this, it's dawned on me that we've had the opposite kind of thing happening, same time. Uh, Stoics were anti-victim culture. They said, you may target me. I may be a target of evil things you do, but I refuse to be the victim of evil things you do, because once you start playing the role of victim, you're going to be a miserable human being. So we can get into that you know, however much you'd like. Yeah, as you point out, it's not at all a political philosophy until it rubs up against a political philosophy that that does seem at bottom to be a, a psychological orientation. You know, victim culture is, is running a, a very particular algorithm, and it's the algorithm of blame, but blaming others for your state of mind is one of the first obstacles and, you know, ultimately illusions that you have to cut through in order to actually practice stoicism. So let's just, let's be very practical here and talk about specific cases. Give me an example of a setback in life that you would turn around in a stoical way. Life is full of setbacks. Uh, in any day, you will experience multiple setbacks. Some of them are tiny setbacks, like you stub your toe or you run out of toothpaste. Those are micro setbacks. Uh, a bigger thing, you might turn your ankle. You might slip and, and fall. And then, of course, we get to the other end of the spectrum and you have some 
semi-catastrophic setbacks. You break a leg. You can just, you know, we get into the list of bad things that can happen to you. The list is quite long. And of course, at the extreme, the end point of that scale of setbacks is death itself. You um, discuss a variety of techniques here, and let's just run through a few of them. One is negative visualization. How, how does that work? To negatively visualize, you think about something bad that could happen. So it's all counterfactual. So for instance, if you can see, you pause to think about what it would be like not to be able to see. Better still, you simply close your eyes for a while and try to imagine what it would be like to go through life with that being the permanent stage state. Then, if you open your eyes, it's a remarkable thing you can see. And if only for a few moments, you'll appreciate your ability to see. One thing I, I do is the relationships I have with other people. So I'm, I'm married, uh, my relationship with my wife. It's very easy to take relationships for granted and stop appreciating them. But one thing you can do is you can pause occasionally to imagine what it would be like if that relationship somehow came to an end. And, and if you do that, it's an interesting thing because the next time you encounter the person in question, you're going to appreciate them. You're going to smile in their presence because you realize that you get another encounter with that person whose company you value. My wife has kind of picked up on this because there will be uh, times when I'm working at home and she'll be in another room and she'll hear me yell out something like, hey, thanks for existing. And, and she <laughs> knows that I've just finished a little session of negative visualization. Because again, if I imagine her not being part of my life, then you realize, wow, what a lucky, lucky guy I am. Now, at this point, it's important to realize that you aren't dwelling on bad things that can happen because that would be a recipe for a miserable existence. What you're doing is you're allowing yourself to have a flickering thought about how things could be worse, a flickering thought. Right. So it's in your head, then it's gone, and then it's back to life as normal. It gives you a basis of comparison. And once you get into it, you realize what a lucky human being you are. I mean, you are living in the heaven on earth of your great great grandparents. You know, you have a flush toilet, you have drinkable water right in your kitchen, you have electric lights that go on and off when you flip a switch. And yet, if you, if you can get a hold of the uh, diaries of your ancestors, a strange thing, you might find out that they were just as happy as you are, yet you have all this mm. stuff. Uh, now, the interesting thing is if you lost this stuff, you would probably be quite unhappy. They never had it, and they were happy. Yeah, so just to reiterate something you said here, many people will be struck when first hearing about this technique by its seeming morbidity, right? And, and, and we'll think that it could be a source of anxiety. I mean, to be thinking about the people closest to you dying, to be thinking about being deprived of things you love, you know, getting cancer when you don't have it, you know, all of these things, to continue to think about how things could be worse seems like it's moving you away from happiness. But again, if you, if you use it as a framing device, in a, as you say, a very brief way, it can be immensely powerful. I mean, there's a few times in my life, I didn't start reading the Stoics until relatively recently, but I, I did notice that a few of these techniques were things I would occasionally do naturally, or, or you know, certain wise people in my life would occasionally force me to do them. There's one example that is actually somewhat resonant with something you write in your book, because you, you talk about plumbing problems in your book, and the most vivid recent version of this for me was we had a, some extraordinary plumbing problems a few years ago where on multiple occasions we would wake up to hear the sound of falling water and enter a room in our house and you know water would just be pouring through the ceiling and after the, this first episode 
we knew what awaited us. It was a, it became a major construction project where you know drywall had to be removed and you know, an immense amount of dust was created and it took weeks and, and we went through this more than once. So the second time this happened, you know, after we had gone through a, a long construction ordeal in response to the first, watching this water pour through the ceiling and uh, my wife is standing next to me and I'm poised to just lose my mind. I have no stoical software running at all. And my wife says, well, just think of how unhappy you'd be if that weren't fresh water pouring through the ceiling, but something else, right? And, uh, you know, there was just, you know, despite myself, my preference for water over sewage coming through the ceiling of my house was so salient that it completely short-circuited my, my negative reaction to this. I was overwhelmed by the feeling of how much worse it could be, and it made me thankful that it was merely this bad. Again, it just takes a second if you can get into the habit of, of thinking in this way. Yeah, and uh, I mentioned you know the, the issue of a broken pipe in um, the Stoic Challenge book. The problem with the broken pipe, there are two problems. One is there won't be water where you need it. You go to wash your hands or brush your teeth, there's no water. But a much bigger problem is there'll be water where you don't need it, right? Through your ceiling, you know, flooding your floors, you're going to have to get a new ceiling, you're going to have to get wood floors relayed. But that's how it is with setbacks. Because in a setback, what does you the most harm in most cases is not the setback itself, but your response to the setback. And the Stoics were clear on this. You may not have had control in the setback occurring to you. Some setbacks are preventable. You know, if you don't want to get stuck on the freeway, put some gasoline in your car. But other setbacks are going to sneak up on you no matter what you do. So if one of those does come, then you can minimize the amount of harm that's done to you simply by saying, you know what, I'm not going to let myself get upset over this. So imagine cars stuck in traffic, right? So you got a meeting to go to, the cars are stuck around you. And so you'll notice some people in their cars are going to be quite angry, quite upset. It's going to put a bad spin on their day. And other people are going to say, ah, well, I'm stuck in traffic. You know what? A good time to be listening to a podcast then as long as I'm sitting here. And you're going to take that moment and you're going to make something out of that moment. And something you said earlier also brought to mind one interesting aspect of this. You were talking about how it sounds so gloomy to go through life thinking about how things could be worse and that it could trigger anxiety. So the Stoics argued just the opposite. They said that if you routinely engage in negative visualization, you'll actually preclude a good degree of anxiety, and also you'll avoid a lot of future regret because by engaging in negative visualization, you will fully appreciate the life you happen to be living. So when you wake up in the morning, you know, and your eyeglasses are still there on the, on the uh, desk where you left them, you say, oh, good, I get another day, another day of life, yeah. another chance to get it right. I also tell in, in the Guide to the Good Life, I tell story of, of two fathers, and this is in conjunction with regret. Regret's a, a very potent emotion. But one father, they both have a, a daughter. One father really pays attention to the daughter, cares for the daughter, spends quality time for the daughter. The other father takes the daughter for granted, rarely encounters the daughter when he does, has superficial interactions with them. And this sounds paradoxical, but the Stoics would say that if those daughters died, right, suppose they, uh, some tragedy, something, a disease, something else killed the two daughters, that the father who had ignored his daughter would experience greater regret than the father who had paid attention. And you might think, well, it's the opposite, because one obviously really loved the daughter and the other was sort of indifferent. But because the one father really did love and appreciate the daughter, he savored the time he could spend with that daughter. And so, you know, it's, uh, it was out of his control that she depart. But while she was there, he extracted the full value of the relationship. 
and and what else can you do? You know, so he has fewer regrets than the other father who's going to be saying, oh, if only I hadn't been such a fool. Yeah. If only I had spent more time. Yeah. So th there's another framing here, which is similar to negative visualization. This is more along the lines of contemplating the finiteness of life. And it goes by the name of the last time meditation you talk about. Uh, and this is something that I also noticed that I, I was doing spontaneously before I encountered it among the Stoics. Take me through the, the last time consideration. Okay. Anything you do could be the last time you do it because you never know when the end is going to come. Now, again, that sounds like a really gloomy thought, but it puts a kind of a positive spin on what you're doing. So I think in, the, in, in one of the books, I, I talk about buying a lawnmower. You know, I had a lawnmower for a quarter of a century. It finally died. I, I went out and bought a new lawnmower. And in the process of buying it, it dawned on me that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm along in years and this might be the last lawnmower I buy. And then the other thing is when I'm using that lawnmower, when I'm out mowing a lawn, just the realization that, you know what, there will come a time if I live long enough when I won't be able to do this. So what could be just me being glum and angry and saying, I have to mow the lawn again, thinking this is, is really a wonderful thing that I'm still healthy and alive enough to be able to do this. In your relationships, anytime you say goodbye to somebody, there's a chance it's the last time you will see them. And again, that can sound very gloomy, but what it does is it keeps the relationship fresh. So what you're going to be saying is, you know what? I really value this person. So I'm going to go out of my way when I'm with them to focus my attention on them, to listen carefully to what they say, to extract the value of this relationship to the extent possible, because that is in my power. And if the relationship ends, then it ends, but it'll end with fewer regrets than would otherwise have been the case. Sounds like a paradox, I know, but that's, that's what the Stoics claim. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this last time consideration also can transform your your relationship to experience that you you don't even like so you, you know, many new parents complain about changing diapers for instance but as, as you're changing your baby's diaper and you think of the fact that this is a totally finite experience i mean this is just there are a number of diaper changes you will experience as a parent and then there will be a last one and there will come a time in your life where you're nostalgic even for that experience i mean that having had that moment of time with your child that you know child of that age you will never see again because they grow and change and it's a completely inscrutable experience of just seeing these stages of life pass before your eyes never to be revisited and you get to the point where you're looking at photographs or even videos of your children and the people you see there are deeply unfamiliar in a way it's even impossible to hold on to the memory, even with all the technology we have at our disposal. This is true for everything. You know, it's just the, the, you know, the last time you get a splinter, right? You know, so the experience of getting a splinter is not something you seek out. But as you're dealing with the, that minor hassle, the reflection that this is, you've had a certain number of these episodes in your life, and this could well be the last one, it connects you to a, a reservoir of patience and kind of affection for life, even for the, the negative moments in life. Yeah, that's, that's very well put. You know, when, when life gives you a difficult moment, there's another kind of similar technique that you can use there. Yeah, it's, it's the last time, but you know, we were talking about frames before, how you can frame events, and in particular, how you can frame setbacks in various ways. So one of the ways in which you can frame a setback, I call it the storytelling frame. Mm. When something bad is happening to you, you can just think in terms of the story you're going to be able to tell someday about that particular event. So my son, let's see, was uh, recently driving across Texas and the car he was in broke down and they were in the middle of nowhere and 
they had to have a toad and he went through the whole thing. And at the end, I said, you know, someday that's going to be a first rate story to tell. And it's an interesting thing because we do, when it comes to setbacks, we do tell other people about them. And some people just complain. They just say, okay, uh, my car broke down and it was awful. And some people say, well, you know, the car broke down and we, we handled it in the following way. And we, we ended up eating tacos at this really great restaurant that we wouldn't have found otherwise. A great story to tell. So that's another way to take the sting out of this moment right now. There's an analogous thing that happens with professional writers, especially writers of fiction. I remember when I was when I first started writing, and I, I thought at that point I was going to write novels, almost anything, no matter how negative, seemed to present itself as fodder for writing some kind of analogous scene, right? Some character going through a similar ordeal. So just being thrust into some scary or you know otherwise destabilizing experience, always at that point in my life had the silver lining of being something that I could figure out how to capture in prose. And I remember I was going through a breakup. My college girlfriend was breaking up with me and I was, you know, quite distraught over it. But a significant portion of my bandwidth was taken up with the effort to actually capture the totality of the experience in writing. And I was actually kind of thrilling to that part of it. And it was, at least for the time that I was doing it, massively undercut the component of psychological suffering. Yeah. And we, my wife and I have lately been traveling a bunch to, uh, to countries where we will be challenged by the different laws and the different customs. And now it's routine when we really hit an interesting snag. And we've hit a few in our time, but when we hit an interesting snag is just to go into storytelling mode and just think, you know, wow, this is really weird, but it's going to make a great story. Now, the interesting thing, you're writing fiction there, right? But it could be fiction based on real events. But in this storytelling frame, for the frame to work it, for, for it to work and have the proper psychological impact. It needs to be honest. And yeah, yeah. You, you, you have to tell the story as the story actually happened. You can't make things up about uh, what happened. Yeah, I came up with a brilliant solution. No come up with one and then it can be part of the story because otherwise uh, it'll have zero impact. You know, this storytelling thing and you have studied evolutionary psychology. So the way it works is we have a rational brain and we have an, an animal brain and uh, the animal brain came first. The rational part of the brain was an after effect and uh, those two simply are playing a different game. They're Forced to, they're like roommates, forced to live together, but playing a different game. But here's the interesting thing. The rational part of the brain can trick the lower part of the brain because it's, it, it, it's smart. It can do that and can come up with these psychological devices. And of course, this was what the Stoics, they didn't think in those evolutionary terms, but this is what they were thinking about. So anger, that's the inner animal taking over the inner animal. It can hijack your higher brain. Uh, it can do it quite easily. And the brain's only defense is the, the, the rational part of the brain's only defense is to, uh, to cut it off at the past, to come up with a way of tricking it. So it doesn't feel the need to be triggered. So, um, let's just persist in walking through the practical armamentarium of stoicism. What is the stoic test strategy? Stoic test strategy, when uh, you're set back, you conceive it to be a kind of a game, a game played between you and the Stoic gods. Now, at this point, people might roll their eyeballs. What do I mean, Stoic gods? Do I believe there are actually Stoic gods? No, I don't. It's a psychological device, a psychological ploy. And if you don't want to talk about Stoic gods, you can instead talk about an imaginary coach or an imaginary teacher. And what these beings, in my case, Stoic gods do, is they're responsible for setting me back. When I have a setback, they're giving me a kind of test. It's a test of my character. It's a test of my ingenuity. Can I find a workaround for the setback? 
And another key thing is they're not doing it to punish me. They're doing it because they want me to be strong and resilient. So actually, I should be flattered that they would consider me worthy of their attention. Other people who never experience setbacks, they're in tough shape because they will, at some point in their life, experience setbacks and they won't be ready for them. But by experiencing setbacks and successfully dealing with them, success means actually finding a workaround and keeping your negative emotions under check at the same time. By doing that, you're going to have a much better life than would otherwise be the case. So they're training you. It's a kind of training. It's to, to build up your ability to bounce when, when life gives you a difficult task. Mm. Yeah, the analogy I have often used is to a video game. We all have these experiences of repeated setbacks and we, the, the same sorts of setbacks keep coming around and we have a, our habitual negative reaction to them. I mean, traffic being the most frequent and obvious. I mean, you know, everyone knows what it's like to be stuck in traffic. It's happened to you recently. It will happen to you soon after hearing this. This is a repeated experience. And so it's like, it's like a video game with predictable levels. And if you imagine that life is a game where the measure of success in the place where you're getting points is in maintaining a positive, you know, tranquil, resilient, flexible state of mind, right? And your failure to do that is really the only failure. I mean, that you can't successfully avoid traffic, but you can successfully avoid being deranged by it psychologically. And so if, if you're playing that game, then, then when you hit these various snags, part of you is inwardly smiling at the opportunity to navigate this particular obstacle. Yeah, playing this game turns setbacks upside down, turns them on their head. Because you actually, when a setback occurs to you, then instead of saying, just grumbling and cursing and saying, oh, this is great, you're going to say, well, this is actually an interesting setback to work on. You become a setback connoisseur. Mm. You think about other setbacks you've experienced and how this relates to them. So you can actually perk up on being set back. And here's the interesting thing. It's a self-graded test, test, you know, so the Stoic gods will never descend to earth and say, you got to be plus well, on that. Actually, to be honest, uh, my wife is grading most of my tests as well, and uh, <laughs> I still fail many of them. Okay. But, you know, failure is part of it. I still get angry. And, you know, but let me pause there to say, I've had emails from people who want Stoicism to involve meditation like Zen Buddhist meditation. They want it to be hard. They want it to be difficult. And I, so I'll say, well, you know, it doesn't really, but how do you get that, that idea? And they say, well, Marcus Aurelius, he has a whole book on it, the meditations. And I have to explain, well, you know, it's a little bit different than that. But these are going to be self-graded tests of uh, how we've done. And it can actually be an interesting high. You know, while other people are there stuck in the traffic, are angry and are upset. You can be congratulating yourself. I'm really holding it in. You know, I'm really doing well. And better still, you can take that time and put it to good use doing something else. And so you haven't been robbed. You've uh, broken even. You've gained. You know, it's like a form of training. If you want to get good at something, you do it repeatedly and you do it thoughtfully. Mm -hmm. And that's true of setbacks. I also describe, you know, the next stage after being a setback connoisseur, the next stage is actually you go out of your way to trigger setbacks mm. just so you can have the practice. This is something you describe as toughness training. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and many of us have an experience like that in, you know, training in martial arts or any, you know, any physical exercise where it's a continual experience of self overcoming, or at least, you know, being brought up against the limits of one's comfort and working with that edge and trying to push yourself into a zone where you're, you've moved beyond your previous limitations or fears or, you know, laziness or, or anything else that has been reigning in your performance. That's something that will be familiar to many people, you know, who work out, but this attitude can be brought into many different areas of life. And at one point you talk about going on stoic adventures. Yeah. So 
there's this idea. A lot of people avoid doing anything hard, anything difficult. And that means they're placing a real upper limit on what they can accomplish in their life. And if you look at truly successful people, truly successful people usually fail routinely. And the interesting thing is they bounce back from those failures. They experience setbacks. They know they are risking setbacks. They successfully work around the setbacks and they, they move on. But that idea of going on, doing something difficult, how come? Just because it's difficult. What makes it difficult? A lot of times what makes it difficult is the setbacks you're going to experience. Doing something difficult can also trigger these voices in you. You know, we have, we have this animal part of the brain. I, I think it's a sign that you're normal. I hope I'm not the only one who hears these voices, but they're always chattering. So, you know, I'll go to dinner, you know, saying I'm going to only have one glass of wine tonight. I got some work to do. And after I finish that one glass of wine, there will be this voice that says, you know, Bill, you deserve a second glass of wine tonight. Really, you do. When I'm working out at the gym, there's a voice that says, you know how good it would feel if you just quit now, if you just stopped? So one of the things you're going to do if you're going to become uh, more resilient and stronger is you're going to learn how to deal with those voices. You're going, to, you're going to expect them to pop up and you're going to, you're going to deal with them properly when they do. So one of the things you can do is what I refer to as a stoic adventure, and that's do something where you know it's going to increase the number of setbacks you experience. So if you just stay home, the setbacks you, you experience are likely to be minimal setbacks. You know, like I said earlier, maybe you'll run out of toothpaste, but get out of the house, go out in the world, try to do something difficult, take a nature hike. You could do something much more dramatic and try to climb a mountain. And even though you plan for everything, setbacks will occur. And when they do, then you get a chance to, to work around them. So you can think of it, again, in this storytelling mode, where what you're doing is you're saying, with my actions on this adventure, I'm going to create a wonderful setback story that I would have the option of someday telling. Now, the Stoics are going to say, you know, you shouldn't be boastful. So you shouldn't be going around boasting to other people about how successfully you did something. But there are times when telling somebody else about a setback can be very useful to them. And under those cases, uh, you should do that. I mentioned that my wife and I have lately been traveling a whole bunch. And we like to travel to places where there will be minimal handholding and yet not too extreme. And we know when we do it that we're going to put ourselves on new learning curves. And we're going to have to figure out how subway systems work. And we're going to have to do a number of things and how the currency works. And, but we do it in the frame of mind that, that that's partly what this experience is about. You know, it's, you, you learn culture, you see how people in other places live, but it's partly a form of stoic training. You know, even somebody who couldn't leave home can still engage in stoic training and it involves doing something where setbacks are likely to occur one of these things because uh when uh, th this latest book came out my publisher said you know you really need to revamp your website so i remember spending a sunday <laughs> revamping it in a major way and it's interesting it's like a, a hurdle race where you're going along you hit a setback you work around that setback, you hit another setback. And it can either be the most frustrating thing you've ever done, but at the end of the day, you go online and you look and you see there it is. And it's an incredibly rewarding feeling. And oh, by the way, you've become better at dealing with technical setbacks. So you've gained some savvy with respect to websites. You come out ahead. You had to pay a price for it. It took effort on your part. But uh, many of the things worth having in life, that's going to be true of. It's going to require effort on your part. The ultimate question is, was the effort rewarded? And uh, in that case, I, I thought it was. What is the next best option? This connects to the serenity prayer that you, you referenced before. How, the, thinking about the next best option, 
when you're faced with with setbacks? Okay, when you're faced with a setback, one of the things you need to do is avoid getting angry. And I describe what I, I sort of jokingly call the five second rule that you have to decide within the first five seconds that you're not going to get angry. Because when you allow yourself to get angry, it's game over. Because mm. your anger, once it starts, it doesn't go away. It doesn't mm. die down. It nags you. I'll just add that this is where meditation practice comes to the rescue. The superpower that this adds to the kinds of techniques we're talking about is that even if you totally lose it, you then have the power to reboot your brain and just let that emotion dissipate and even let all of the the negative concomitants to it dissipate so like, well, let's say you have you, you know you've, you've started down the path of having a very non-stoical reaction you're creating more and more chaos around you you know within you and in your relationships and perhaps you've done something or you know sent that tweet that you wish you hadn't sent or whatever it is but at any point it is available for you to notice that anger in this case dissipates very, very quickly when you're no longer lost in thought about all the reasons why you should be angry, right? You're no longer blaming that other person for the idiotic thing he did. You're just becoming interested in, in the physiology of this response. And then, then it, you can get back on track very quickly. But I agree with you, the, the sooner the better. And five seconds is a, is a nice rule. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Now, again, I haven't uh, explored uh, meditation as uh, deeply as I should have and, and hope to in the future. But the anger, one thing is I had an interesting illustration of the role anger plays. I was at a doctor's office and they left me sitting in their waiting room for an hour and a half, you know, before I got in. And I, I was out there thinking, oh, oh, this is a splendid stoic test. <laughs> And I had brought along podcasts to listen to because I knew, you know, that's a likely thing that could happen. And, you know, I started out saying, a oh, wonderful chance to get caught up on podcasts. But, and I'm not quite sure how this happened, but along the way, anger got triggered. And once it did, it wouldn't go away. And I had interesting kind of clinical feedback on this because when I finally was admitted to a, a room back there, they took my blood mm. pressure and it was 170 over 90. Mm. You know, I'm normally 120 over 80, <laughs> no matter what. Right. And once your blood pressure is that high, to turn it down is just really difficult. So yes, yeah. I did yell at the doctor and was just ashamed. Yeah. Hey, but it's stoic practice. And the, the, the thought there is, is practice and practice makes perfect. Meditations, Seneca describes what he calls the bedtime meditation. But it isn't, again, it isn't like a Zen meditation, but what you should do is take a few moments at bedtime to think about your day, to think about the things that happened to you, and to think about your response to those things. Mm. So it's meditation in a different sense. One other thing about anger is, ideally, when you're set back, one of the ways, the grade you give yourself when the setback has passed will have two components. One is, did you keep your cool? Did you, in fact, cheer up as a result of being set back? But the second component is how good was the workaround you found to the setback? And what I've experienced is anger kills creativity. So a lot of times, if you're set back, there's some really great, ingenious workaround. You're just not going to see it. You're not even going to think about it if you're angry. So anger. If you allow yourself to, to get angry, you're a double loser. Not only do you have to experience the anger, which might linger on long after the event is over, but the work around you do will be a suboptimal work around. Mm. So, you know, if you can avoid, if you can avoid getting angry, that's wonderful. And again, one way to do it is you, but you gotta be quick. Ah, this is a setback to work on. I wonder how I can best deal with it. Like I say, I'm not 100% yet, but I'm, I've gotten a lot better at avoiding anger. Well, so I got you on to anger by asking you about the next best option consideration. So something bad happens and there are a range of possible responses. There are things you can do, things you can control, and things you can't. How do you think about 
the remaining options in that moment. So if something ceases to be an option, then you dismiss it and work your way on to the next uh, uh, option. Teddy Roosevelt is famous for saying uh, the, fo the following saying, although he, he apparently stole it, but he said, what you should do is you do what you can with what you've got where you are. Do what you can with what you've got where you are. And it could be, the Stoics never said that to my knowledge, but it's a wonderful slogan for Stoicism. So you look at one option and that option either turns out to be not feasible or that option goes away, it disappears. So now what are you gonna do? You're gonna do what you can with what you've got where you are. And that's, that's your definition of success. So success means what? If you're set back, success means what? It means two things, not getting upset and finding the optimal workaround. The optimal workaround won't be a perfect workaround probably, but it'll just be better than the alternatives because what else can you do, you know? And for you to be beating yourself up for not doing something that you couldn't do is craziness. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all of this ultimately falls into the rubric of not suffering unnecessarily. You can almost always find a possible reason to be made miserable by experience. You can always do the opposite of the, the negative visualization. You can, you can think of all the good things you don't have and may never get, and you can enviously look at the lives of others who seem to be enjoying more than you are on Instagram, or you can keep finding ways to simply experience life as it comes and work creatively with it with less and less anguish and anxiety about what may or may not happen. Yeah, we're responsible for most of the misery we experience because, you know, depending on how you frame it, you're either one of the most miserable people on earth or you're one of the luckiest human beings ever to walk the earth. And, you know, so I, I teach classes. I, I tell my students, you know, I, I ask them how satisfied they are with life. And, you know, some of them say, yeah, pretty, pretty much. And then you kind of dissect it. You know, we, we talked about a leaking pipe before. If you lived in certain countries in Africa, not only would you not have running water, but you wouldn't even have water free of various parasites. And you would have to carry that water on your back, maybe three miles. And if you're a young woman, the decision of who you were going to marry might turn on how far you would have to carry the water if you married that person. Mm. And then once you start thinking about those things, you know, it's like, well, you know, that you would be upset over a broken water pipe shows what a pampered human being you are. Because in the history of the world, go back four generations, right? They didn't even have indoor toilets then. But it's all a question of how you frame it and how you, you anchor it. What are you comparing it against? The idea of comparing yourself against other people is a road to misery. Because number one, they aren't telling you the truth. They're going to make out to be much happier than in fact they, they are. And the idea is not to play their game. What are they interested in? They're interested in some broad sense in fame and fortune. So they'd like to have lots of money and they would like to be admired by the people around them. And of those two, being admired is is the more important, I think, because, you know, would you, would you really want to be the richest man on earth if there were no other people on earth? But playing that game, th this is kind of the theme I was, I was pushing in the book called On Desire, which is the book that I was uh, working on when my interest in stoicism was aroused, mm. is just it's a loser's game, and yet so many people play it. How come? Because they either don't have a philosophy of life, or they have a philosophy of life that places the highest value on fame and fortune, you know, understood in some broad sense. It's a game they can't win. How come? Because the way it works is you form a desire. Okay, you're unhappy until you get the thing you desire. Okay, 
And then that becomes the new level from which you judge things. And now it's, well, you know, I could have an even better car. I could have an even bigger house. So it's a loser's game. And yet most people play it simply because they've never really thought it through carefully. Yeah, well, so this does relate to something that would otherwise be mysterious. The fact that you pointed out that if you if we, we could read the the journals of our ancestors who were deprived of every modern convenience that we would be miserable to have break down, we discover that they were, in certainly most cases, more or less as happy as we and, and our friends are. There's this phenomenon of hedonic adaptation, where people get used to a certain level of experience, and they have a kind of happiness set point that returns to its baseline in the midst of really any changes. So no matter how big your house, no matter how successful your book, no matter how good the marriage, you begin to find your level of hedonic set point. And then what continues to happen to, to most people is that the things that nudge you up or down are very often comparative. You're just looking at the lives of others, which are continually being advertised to you, both you know in the news and on social media and in even in fiction, and obviously in one's personal life, you know, with with friends and family. And it's in comparison to what is happening for others that people tend to get pushed around. And this is pretty perverse when you look at just the history of human progress, because now we're in a situation where you know even the poorest people in the best societies have much more and much more insulation against misery and death than most people had, you know, hundreds of years ago. And you know, certainly middle-class people in first world societies are much better off than people were hundreds of years ago. But in many cases, they, they are probably much less happy because we're experiencing a, a level of wealth inequality that in, in many societies is quite shocking and untenable. And what, what makes it untenable is this disposition for people to anchor their sense of their own well-being, not to the actual objective changes in human circumstance generally over the decades, but to what the most fortunate, you know, 1% among us are experiencing. Yeah. That idea of, you know, the hedonic set point, it's an interesting thing because we routinely let other people set our set point for us. They do that with their um, Facebook pages telling us all the wonderful things that are happening. They do that by flaunting possessions. But given that the hedonic set point is one of the key variables in determining how happy you are or how happy you aren't, it seems absolutely crazy to turn the power to set that over to some other person, even to somebody you, you don't even know. So that was the genius behind negative visualization, because it allows you to be the one who resets your hedonic set point, and it allows you to turn it down. And if you turn down your set point, then whatever life you happen to be living to you will seem like a much more satisfactory life than was previously the case. You know, we were talking before about how the Stoics, uppercase S Stoics, weren't lowercase S Stoical, how they welcomed delight, how they welcomed joy. The Stoics, because in part because of negative visualization, would come across as not just cheerful people, but insanely cheerful people who could find a silver lining in almost any cloud they could experience. But that's a wonderful skill to have if what you seek to be is a happy human being. And one other uh, qualification there, as far as I can tell from my reading of the Stoics, they didn't have a recipe for happiness. They had instead a recipe for avoiding negative emotions because they knew that negative emotions are an obstacle. If your goal is to be happy, whatever that means, you can't be happy if you're angry. You can't be happy if you're experiencing envy. You can't be happy if you're experiencing regret. So there's no guarantee that you will be happy if you can overcome those, but it increases your chances dramatically because you're eliminating the obstacles to happiness. Well, what would you do with the folk psychological and probably ultimately Freudian 
claim that this risks simply suppressing these negative emotions? If done right, and that's another thing, that so the Stoics were not simply good at suppressing the emotions, they were good at preventing the emotions. And we're, we were talking about, about anger. And again, how do you prevent the emotion? Well, you trick the animal part of your brain. And, and it's easy to hoodwink because, you know, it's just not very thoughtful. It's just reactive to its uh, circumstances. So you use one of these psychological ploys to trick it and to distract it and then to get set on some different course. And then it forgets. It forgets what the problem was. But once you wake it up, you got a monster to deal with, not just for that moment. You know, it's interesting because in my life, I've known people who, you know, in their, in their old age be, became senile, uh, demented, and so on. And they can't remember where they are. They can't remember what day of the week is. But they can remember something that made them angry 50 years before. And they can tell you about it in great detail. That is absolutely scary that anger can have that power. But it can only have that power if you let it wake up. So the idea is, is trick it, distract it for the few moments necessary to set a different course with what you're doing. Hmm. Well, Bill, it's incredibly helpful to walk through these topics. And um, my current aspiration is to get much better at stoicism. That's the, the New Year's plan. I'm, I'm making my resolution early this year. Okay, that's my goal too, by the way, because again, it is, it is practice. I'll have a way.